The words of our Lord Jesus Christ to his chosen and dearly beloved bride, Saint Bridget, about the proclamation of his most holy incarnation and the rejection, desecration and abandonment of our faith in baptism, and how he bids his beloved bride and all Christian people to love him. Chapter 1. I am the creator of the heavens and the earth, one in divinity with the Father and the Holy Spirit. I am the one who spoke to the patriarchs and the prophets and the one whom they awaited. For the sake of their longing and in agreement with my promise, I assumed flesh without sin and concupiscence, by entering the womb of the Virgin like the sun shining through the clearest gem. For just as the sun does not damage the glass by entering it, likewise the virginity of the Virgin was not lost when I assumed manhood. I assumed flesh in such a way that I did not have to forsake my divinity, and I was no less God, with the Father and the Holy Spirit, governing and upholding all things, although I was in the womb of the Virgin in my human nature. Just as brightness is never separated from fire, so too, my divinity was never separated from my humanity, not even in death. Thereafter I allowed my pure and sinless body to be wounded from the foot to the head, and to be crucified for all the sins of mankind. That same body is now offered each day on the altar so that mankind might love me more and remember my great deeds more often. But now I am totally forgotten, neglected, despised, and expelled as a king is from his own kingdom and in whose place the most wicked robber has been elected and honored. I have indeed wanted my kingdom to be within man, and by right I should be king and lord over him, for I made him and redeemed him. However, now he has broken and desecrated the faith which he promised me in his baptism, and he has broken and spurned my laws and commandments which I prescribed and revealed to him. He loves his own will and refuses to hear me. In addition, he exalts the most wicked robber, the devil, above me and has given him his faith. The devil really is a robber, since he steals for himself, by way of evil temptations, bad counsels, and false promises, the human soul that I redeemed with my blood. But he does not do this because he is mightier than me, for I am so mighty that I can do all things with the word, and so just, that even if all the saints ask me, I would not do the least thing against justice. But, since man, who has been given free will, willfully rejects my commandments and obeys the devil, it is only right that he also experiences his tyranny and malice. This devil was created good by me, but fell by his own wicked will, and has become, so to speak, my servant for inflicting vengeance on the workers of evil, yet, even though I am now so despised, I am still so merciful that whoever prays for my mercy and humbles himself in amendment shall be forgiven his sins, and I shall save him from the evil robber, the devil. But to those who continue despising me, I shall visit my justice upon them, so that those hearing it will tremble, and those who feel it will say, Whoa, that we were ever conceived or born. Whoa, that we ever provoked the Lord of Majesty to wrath. But you, my daughter, whom I have chosen for myself, and with whom I now speak in spirit, love me with all your heart, not as you love your son or daughter or parents, but more than anything in the world, since I, who created you, did not spare any of my limbs in suffering for your sake. Yet, I love your soul so dearly that, rather than losing you, I would let myself be crucified again, if it were possible. Imitate my humility, for I, the King of glory and of angels, was clothed in ugly, wretched rags and stood naked at the pillar and heard all kinds of insults and ridicule with my own ears. Always prefer my will before your own, because my mother, your lady, has, from the beginning to the end, never wanted anything but what I wanted. If you do this, then your heart shall be with my heart, and it will be inflamed by my love in the same way that anything dry becomes rapidly inflamed by fire. Your soul shall be so inflamed and filled with me, and I will be in you, so that everything worldly becomes bitter to you and all fleshly lusts like poison. You will rest in the arms of my divinity, where no fleshly desires exist, but only spiritual delight and joy which fill the delighted soul with happiness, inwardly and outwardly, so that it thinks of nothing and desires nothing but the joy which it possesses. So love me alone, and you will have all the things you want, and you will have them in abundance. 
Is it not written that the oil of the widow did not decrease until the day the rain was sent to earth by God according to the words of the prophet? I am the true prophet. If you believe my words and follow and fulfill them, the oil, joy and jubilation, shall never decrease for you for all eternity. Our Lord Jesus Christ's words to his daughter, whom he now had taken as his bride, about the articles of the true faith, and about what kind of adornments, tokens and desires the bride must have in order to please the bridegroom. Chapter 2 I am the creator of the heavens and the earth, and the sea and of all the things that are in them. I am one with the Father and the Holy Spirit, not like the gods of stone nor the gods of gold, as were used by people of old, and not several gods, as people once thought, but one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, three persons but one in divine nature, the creator of all but created by none, unchangeable and almighty, everlasting, without beginning or end. I am the one who was born of the Virgin, without losing my divinity but joining it to my manhood, so that I, in one person, should be the true Son of God and the Son of the Virgin. I am the one who hung on the cross and died and was buried, yet my divinity remained unharmed. For even though I died in the manhood and flesh that I, the only Son, had assumed, yet I lived on in my divinity, being one God with the Father and the Holy Spirit. I am the same one who rose from the dead and ascended into heaven, and who now speaks with you in my spirit. I have chosen you and taken you to myself as my bride in order to show you the ways of the world and my divine secrets, for this pleases me. You are also mine by right, for when your husband died, you entrusted all your will into my hands and, after his death, you also thought and prayed about how you should become poor and abandon all things for my sake. For this reason, you are mine by right because of this great love of yours, and I will provide for you because of this. Therefore, I take you to myself as my bride and for my own pleasure, the kind that is becoming for God to have with a chaste soul. It is the obligation of the bride to be ready when the bridegroom wants to celebrate the wedding so that she will be properly dressed and pure. You purify yourself well if your thoughts are always on your sins, on how I cleansed you in baptism from the sin of Adam, and how often I have been patient and supported you when you fell into sin. The bride should also have the insignia of her bridegroom on her chest, which means that you should observe and take heed of the favors and good deeds which I have done for you, such as how nobly I created you by giving you a soul and body, how nobly I enriched you by giving you health and temporal things, how lovingly and sweetly I redeemed you when I died for you and restored your heavenly inheritance to you, if you want to have it. The bride should also do the will of the bridegroom. But what is my will? Except that you should want to love me above all things and not desire anything but me. I created all things for the sake of mankind, and placed all things under his authority, but he loves all things except me, and hates nothing but me. I bought back the inheritance for him which he had lost because of his sin. But he is so foolish and without reason that he prefers this passing glory, which is like the foam of the sea that rises up for a moment like a mountain, and then quickly falls down to nothing instead of eternal glory in which there is everlasting good. But if you, my bride, desire nothing but me, if you despise all things for my sake, not only your children and relatives, but also honor and riches, I will give you the most precious and lovely reward. I will not give you gold or silver, but myself, to be your bridegroom and reward, I, who am the King of glory. But if you are ashamed of being poor and despised, then consider how I, your God, walked before you, when my servants and friends abandoned me in the world, for I was not seeking earthly friends, but heavenly friends. And if you now are troubled and afraid about the burden and difficulty of work and sickness, then consider how difficult and painful it is to burn in hell. What would you not deserve if you had offended an earthly master as you have me? For even though I love you with all my heart, still I do not act against justice in the least point. Therefore. As you have sinned in all your limbs, so shall you also make satisfaction and penance in every limb. But, because of your good will and your purpose of atoning for your sins, I shall change my justice into mercy by foregoing painful punishment for but a little penance. Therefore, embrace and take upon yourself a little work, so that you may be made clean of sin and reach the great reward sooner. 
for the bride should grow tired working alongside her bridegroom so that she may all the more confidently take her rest with him. Our Lord Jesus Christ's words of wisdom to his bride about how she should love and honor him, the bridegroom, and about how the evil love the world and hate God. Chapter 3 I am your God and Lord, whom you worship and honor. I am the one who upholds heaven and earth with my power, they are not upheld by any pillars or anything else. I am the one who is handled and offered up each day on the altar under the appearance of bread as true God and true man. I am the same one who has chosen you. Honor my father. Love me. Obey my spirit. Honor my mother as your lady. Honor all my saints. Keep the true faith which you shall learn by him who experienced within himself the battle of the two spirits, the spirit of falsehood and the spirit of truth, and with my help one. Maintain true humility. What is true humility if not to behave as one really is, and to give praise to God for the good things he has given us? But now, there are many who hate me and my deeds, and who account my words as sorrow and vanity, but instead, with affection and love, embrace the whoremonger, the devil. Whatever they do for my sake is done with grumbling and bitterness. They would not even confess my name or serve me, if they did not fear the opinion of other men. They love the world with such fervor that they never tire of working for it night and day, always burning with their love for it. Their service is as pleasing to me as that of someone who gives his enemy money to kill his own son. This is what they do to me. They give me some alms and honor me with their lips in order to gain worldly success and to remain in their honor and in their sin. The good spirit is therefore hindered in them and they are prevented from making any progress in doing good. However, if you want to love me with all your heart and to desire nothing but me, I will draw you to myself through love, just as a magnet draws iron to itself. I will place you on my arm, which is so strong that no one can stretch it out, and so firm that, once outstretched, no one is able to bend it back, and is so sweet that it surpasses every fragrance and is beyond comparison to any sweet thing or delight of this world. Explanation This man, who was the teacher of the Bride of Christ, was the holy theologian and canon of Linköping, named Master Matthias of Sweden. He wrote an excellent commentary on the whole Bible. He was ingenuously tempted by the devil with many heresies against the Catholic faith. However, he overcame all of them with the help of Christ and could not be conquered by the devil, as is shown in the written biography of Saint Bridget. It was this Master Matthias who composed the prologue to these books which begins thus, Stupor et Mirabilia, etc. He was a holy man with great spiritual power in both word and deed. When he died in Sweden, the Bride of Christ was living in Rome. While she was praying, she heard a voice saying to her in spirit, Happy are you, Master Matthias, for the crown that has been prepared for you in heaven. Come now to the wisdom that will never end. One may also read more about Master Matthias in this book, in chapter 52, in book V, in the answer to question 3 in the last interrogation, and in book Virgin Islands, chapter 75 and 89. Our Lord Jesus Christ's words to his bride about how she should not fear or think that the revelations told to her by him come from an evil spirit, and about how to discern an evil spirit from a good one. Chapter 4 I am your Creator and Redeemer. Why did you fear and doubt my words? Why did you wonder whether they came from a good or an evil spirit? Tell me, what have you found in my words that your conscience did not tell you to do? Or have I ever commanded you anything against reason? The bride answered, No, all you told me was completely true and reasonable and I was badly mistaken. The bridegroom, Jesus, answered her, I showed you three things from which you could recognize the good spirit, I invited you to honor your God, who made you and gave you all the good things you have, your reason also tells you to honor him above all things. I further invited you to keep the true faith, that is, to believe that nothing has been created without God nor may be made without God. I also invited you to love reasonable work and continence in all things, for the world was created for man's sake in order that he may use it according to his reasonable needs, and not in excess. In the same way, you may also recognize the unclean spirit, the devil, from three opposing things, 
he tempts and advises you to seek and desire your own praise, and to be proud of the things given you. He also tempts you into unbelief and intemperance in all your limbs and in all things, and makes your heart inflamed by them. Sometimes he also deceives men under the guise of a good spirit. This is why I commanded you to always examine your conscience and reveal it to spiritual men of wisdom. Therefore, do not doubt that the good spirit of God is with you when you desire nothing but God and are completely inflamed by him. Only I can do this, and it is impossible for the devil to come near you then. He also cannot come near to any evil man unless I allow it, either because of his sins, or some secret judgment that is known only to me. For he is my creature like all other things, he was created good by me, but made himself evil by his own malice, therefore, I am Lord over him. Therefore, those who accuse me do so falsely when they say that those who serve me with great and godly devotion are insane and possessed by the devil. They consider me to be like a man who gives his chaste and trusting wife over to adultery. Such a one should I be, if I allowed a righteous and God-loving man to be handed over to the devil. But because I am faithful, the devil will never rule over the soul of any man who devoutly serves me. Although my friends sometimes seem to be insane or senseless, it is not because the devil is tormenting them, or because they serve me with fervent and godly devotion. It is rather because of some defect or weakness in the brain, or some other hidden reason, which serves to humble them. It may also happen, sometimes, that the devil receives power from me over the bodies of good men for the sake of their future reward, or that he darkens their consciences. But he can never rule the souls of those who have faith in me and who love me. The loving words of Christ to his bride in the wonderful parable of a lovely castle, which signifies the Holy Church militant, and about how the Church of God will be rebuilt by the prayers of the glorious Virgin and of the saints. Chapter 5 I am the Creator of all things, I, the King of glory and the Lord of angels. I built for myself a lovely castle and placed my chosen men in it, but my enemies undermined the foundation and overpowered my friends so much so that the marrow was violently forced out of my friends' feet as they sit chained to the wooden stocks. Their mouth is beaten by stones, and they are tortured by hunger and thirst. Moreover, enemies are persecuting their Lord. My friends are now praying with tears and groans for help, and justice is calling for vengeance, but mercy says to forgive. Then God said to his heavenly host that stood around him, What do you think about these who have conquered my castle? They all answered as with one voice, O Lord, all justice is in you, and in you we see all things. You are without beginning and without end, the Son of God, and all judgment is given to you. You are their judge. He answered, Although you know and see all things in me, still for the sake of my bride who stands here, tell me the just sentence. They said, This is justice, that those who undermine the wall should be punished as thieves, that those who persist in evil should be punished as intruders and violent criminals, and that those who are captive should be freed and the hungry be filled. Then Mary, the mother of God, who until now had remained silent, spoke, O, oh, my Lord and most dear Son, you were in my womb as true God and man. By your grace you sanctified me, who was but an earthen vessel. I beg you, have mercy on them once more. Then the Lord answered his mother, Blessed be the words of your mouth that ascend like a sweet fragrance to God. You are the queen and glory of angels and all saints because, by you, God and all the saints are made happy. Because your will was as my own from the beginning of your youth, I will do as you wish once more. Then he said to the host of saints, Because you have fought manfully, and for the sake of your love, I will let myself be appeased for now. Behold, I will rebuild my wall because of your prayers. I will liberate and heal those who were oppressed by force, and honor them a hundredfold for the indignity they have endured. But if the violators and wrongdoers pray for my mercy, I will give them peace and mercy. However, those who despise my mercy will feel my justice. Then he said to his bride, My bride, I have chosen you and brought you into my spirit. You hear my words and those of my saints. Although the saints see all things in me, nevertheless, they have spoken for your sake so that you might understand, since you, who are still in the flesh, cannot see all things in me in the same way as they who are spirits. 
I will now also show you what all these things signify. The castle I spoke about previously is the holy church and the souls of Christians, which I built with my own blood and that of the saints. I cemented and joined it with my love and placed my friends and chosen men in it. The foundation is true faith, that is, to believe that I am a righteous and merciful judge. Now, however, this foundation is undermined because all believe and preach that I am merciful, but almost no one preaches or believes me to be a righteous judge. They view me as an unjust judge. Unjust and unrighteous, indeed, would the judge be who, out of mercy, allowed the unrighteous to go unpunished, so that they could oppress the righteous even more. But I am a righteous and merciful judge, for I do not let even the least sin go unpunished, nor the least good go unrewarded. By the undermining of this wall's foundation, there entered into the holy church people who sin without fear, who deny that I am a righteous judge, and who torment my friends as severely as those who are placed in the stocks. My friends have no joy or consolation given to them but, instead, every kind of mockery and torment are inflicted upon them as if they were possessed by the devil. When they tell the truth about me, they are rejected and accused of lying. They have a fervent desire to hear or speak the truth about me, but there is no one who listens to them or speaks the truth to them. And I, the Lord and Creator of all things, am being blasphemed and rejected, for they say, we do not know if he is God and, if he is God, we do not care. They overthrow my banner and trample it under their feet calling out, why did he suffer? What benefit is it to us? If he wants to satisfy our lust and will, it is enough for us. He may keep his kingdom and heaven. I want to go into them, but they say, we would rather die before giving up our own will. Behold, my bride, what kind of people they are. I made them and could destroy and damn them with a word if I wanted to. How bold and arrogant they are toward me. But because of the prayers of my mother and of all the saints, I am still so merciful and patient that I will send them the words of my mouth and offer them my mercy. If they want to accept it, I will be appeased. Otherwise, they will come to know my justice and be publicly humiliated like thieves in front of all angels and men, and be judged by every one of them. For just as the men who are hanged on gallows are devoured by ravens, they will also be devoured by demons, yet not die. Just as those who are punished in the stocks have no rest, they too, will have pain and bitterness all around them. The most burning river will flow into their mouths, but their bellies will not be filled, and their punishment will be renewed each day. But my friends will be redeemed and consoled by the words that come from my mouth. They will see my justice joined with my mercy. I will clothe them in the weapons of my love and make them so strong that the adversaries of the faith will fall back like filth and feel ashamed for all eternity when they see my justice. Yes, they will surely be ashamed for having abused my patience. The words of Christ to his bride about how his spirit cannot remain with the unrighteous, and about the separation of the unrighteous from the good, and how good men, armed with spiritual weapons, are sent to war against the world. Chapter 6 My enemies are like the most violent beasts that can never be filled or have rest. Their heart is so empty of my love that they never allow the thought of my suffering into it, and not once has a word like this been uttered by their inmost heart, O Lord, you have redeemed us, may you be praised for your bitter suffering. How could my spirit remain with the people who have no divine love for me? and who willingly betray others in order to satisfy their own will. Their heart is full of vile worms, that is, full of worldly desires. The devil has left his filth in their mouths, and that is why my words do not please them. Therefore, I will sever them from my friends with my saw, and just as there is no more bitter way to die than to be sawn asunder, so there will not be a punishment in which they will not partake. They will be sawn in two by the devil and separated from me. They are so abhorrent to me that all who cling to them and agree with them will also be severed from me. Therefore, I send out my friends in order that they might separate the devils from my members, for they are truly my enemies. I send my friends like knights to war. Anyone who mortifies and subdues his flesh and abstains from forbidden things is my true knight, for their lance, they will have the words that I spoke with my own mouth and, 
in their hands, the sword of the true faith. Their breasts will be covered with the armor of love, so that no matter what happens to them, they will love me no less. They shall have the shield of patience at their side, so that they may suffer and endure all things patiently. I have enclosed them like gold in a vessel, they should now go forth and walk in my ways. According to the ways of justice, I could not enter into the glory of majesty without suffering tribulation in my human nature, so then, how else will they enter into it? If their Lord endured pain and suffering, it is not surprising that they also suffer. If their Lord endured beatings and torture, it is not too much for them to endure words and contradictions. They should not fear, for I will never abandon them. Just as it is impossible for the devil to touch and divide the heart of God, so it is impossible for the devil to separate them from me. And since they are like the purest gold in my sight, I will never abandon them, even though they are tested with a little fire, for the fire is given to them for their greater reward and happiness. The words of the glorious virgin to Saint Bridget about how to dress and with what kind of clothes and ornaments her daughter should be adorned and clothed. Chapter 7 I am Mary who gave birth to the Son of God, true God and true man. I am the Queen of Angels. My Son loves you with all of his heart. Therefore, you should love him. You should be adorned with the most proper clothes, and I will show you how and what kind they should be. Just as before you had an undershirt, a shirt, shoes, a cloak, and a brooch on your chest, so now you shall have spiritual clothes. The undershirt you shall have is contrition for your sins, for just as an undershirt is closest to the body, so contrition and confession are the first way of conversion to God. Through these the mind, which once enjoyed sin, is purified, and the unchaste flesh restrained from evil lusts. The two shoes are two intentions, namely, the will to make amendment for your past sins, and the will to do good and refrain from evil. Your shirt is hope in God, and just as a shirt has two sleeves, so may justice and mercy be paired with your hope, so that you will hope for the mercy of God, yet not forget his justice. Think about his justice and harsh judgment in such a way that you do not forget his mercy, for he does not work justice without mercy, or mercy without justice. The cloak is faith, for just as the cloak covers everything and everything is enclosed in it, man can likewise comprehend and attain all things by faith. This cloak should be decorated with the tokens of your bridegroom's love, namely, how he created you, how he redeemed you, how he raised you and led you into his spirit and opened your spiritual eyes. The brooch, which should always be on your chest, is the frequent consideration of his suffering, how he was mocked and scourged, how he stood alive on the cross, bloody and wounded in all his limbs, how in death his whole body shook from the most bitter pain and anguish, and how he commended his spirit into the hands of his father. May this brooch always be on your chest. There should also be a crown on your head, which means that you should be chaste in your desires, so much so, that you would rather endure a beating and pain than to be further stained. Therefore, be modest and polite and do not think about or desire anything but your God and Creator, for when you have Him, you have everything. Adorned in this way, you shall await your bridegroom. The words of the Queen of Heaven to her beloved daughter, Saint Bridget, teaching her how she should love and praise the Son of God together with his blessed mother. Chapter 8 I am the Queen of Heaven. You are concerned about how you should praise and honor me. Know and be certain that all praise of my Son also is praise of me, and those who dishonor him also dishonor me. This is so because I loved him and he loved me so ardently that both of us were like one heart. He so magnificently honored me, who was an earthen vessel, that he raised me above all the angels. Therefore, you should praise me like this, blessed be you, God, creator of all things, who deigned to descend into the womb of the Virgin Mary. Blessed be you, God, who wished to be within the Virgin Mary without burdening her, and deigned to take immaculate flesh from her without sin. Blessed be you, God, who came to the Virgin, bringing joy to her soul and her whole body, and who went out of her without sin, to the joy of her whole body. Blessed be you, God, who after your heavenly ascension gladdened the Virgin Mary, your mother, with continuous comforts and visited her with your consolation. Blessed be you, God, who assumed the body and soul of the Virgin Mary, your mother, 
into heaven and honorably placed her above all the angels next to your divinity. Have mercy on me for the sake of all her prayers. The words of the Queen of Heaven to her beloved daughter about the wonderful love the Son had for his virgin mother, and about how the mother of Christ was conceived within the most chaste marriage and sanctified in the womb. She tells how she was assumed, body and soul, into heaven, and about the power of her name, and about the good and evil angels assigned to men for their protection or trial. Chapter 9 I am the Queen of Heaven. Love my Son, for he is most worthy, when you have him, you have all that is worthwhile. He is also most desirable, when you have him, you have all that is desirable. Love him, too, for he is most virtuous, when you have him, you have every virtue. I want to tell you how wonderful his love for my body and soul was and how much he honored my name. My son loved me before I loved him, since he is my creator. He united my father and mother in a marriage so chaste that there could not be found a more chaste marriage at that time. They never wanted to come together except in accordance with the law, and only then with the intention to bring forth offspring. When an angel revealed to them that they would give birth to the virgin from whom the salvation of the world would come, they would rather have died than to come together in carnal love, lust was dead in them. I assure you that when they did come together, it was because of divine love and because of the angel's message, not out of carnal desire, but against their will and out of a holy love for God. In this way, my flesh was put together by their seed and through divine love. Then, when my body had been made and formed, God infused the created soul into it from his divinity, and the soul was immediately sanctified along with the body, and the angels guarded and served it day and night. When my soul was sanctified and joined to its body, my mother felt such great joy that it would have been impossible to describe it. Afterwards, when my lifetime had been accomplished, my son first raised up my soul, for it was the mistress of the body, to a more excellent place than others in heaven, right next to his divinity. Later, he also raised up my body in such a manner that no other creature's body is so close to God as mine. See how much my son loved my soul and body. Yet, there are some people with a malevolent spirit who deny that I was assumed into heaven, body and soul, and also others who simply do not know any better. But this is a most certain truth, I, with body and soul, was assumed to the divinity. Hear now how much my son honored my name. My name is Mary, as it is said in the Gospel. When the angels hear this name, they rejoice in their mind and thank God for the great mercy that he worked through me and with me and because they see my son's humanity glorified in his divinity. Those within the fire of purgatory rejoice exceedingly, just like a sick and bedridden man does if he receives a word of comfort that pleases his soul, he is suddenly overjoyed. When the good angels hear my name, they immediately move closer to the righteous for whom they are guardians, and rejoice over their progress in good deeds and virtues. All humans have been given both good angels for their protection, and bad angels to test them. The good angels are not separated from God, they serve the soul without leaving God. They are constantly in his sight. Yet they work to inflame and incite the soul to do good. All the demons, however, shudder with fear at the name of Mary. When they hear the name, Mary, they immediately release a soul out of the claws with which they had held her. Just as a bird or hawk, with its claws and beak embedded into its prey, releases it immediately if it hears a sound, but soon returns when it sees that no action follows, so do the demons, frightened when they hear my name, release the soul. But they return and fly back as fast as an arrow if no improvement follows. No one is so cold in his love of God, unless he is damned, that he will not experience the devil releasing him from his habitual sins if only he invokes my name with the true intention of never returning to his evil deeds. The devil will never return to him unless he resumes the will to commit mortal sins. Sometimes, though, the devil is allowed to trouble him for the sake of his greater reward. However, the devil shall never own him. The words of Virgin Mary to her daughter, presenting a useful lesson about how she should live, and describing many wonderful things about the suffering of Christ. Chapter 10 I am the Queen of Heaven, the Mother of God. 
I told you to wear a brooch on your chest. I will now show you more fully how, from the beginning, when I first heard and understood that God existed, I always, and with fear, was concerned about my salvation and my observance of his commandments. But when I learned more about God, that he was my creator and the judge of all my actions, I loved him more dearly, and I was constantly fearful and watchful so as to not offend him by word or deed. Later, when I heard that he had given the law and the commandments to the people and worked such great miracles through them, I made a firm decision in my soul to never love anything but him, and all worldly things became most bitter to me. When still later I heard that God himself would redeem the world and be born of a virgin, I was seized by such great love for him that I thought of nothing but God and desired nothing but him. I withdrew myself, as much as I was able, from the conversation and presence of parents and friends, and I gave away all my possessions to the poor, and kept nothing for myself but meager food and clothing. Nothing was pleasing to me but God. I always wished in my heart to live until the time of his birth, and perhaps, deserve to become the unworthy handmaid of the mother of God. I also promised in my heart to keep my virginity, if this was acceptable to him, and to have no possessions in the world. However, if God wanted otherwise, my will was that his will, not mine, be done, for I believed that he could do all things and wanted nothing but what was beneficial and best for me. Therefore, I entrusted all my will to him. When the time approached for the virgins to be presented in the temple of the Lord, I was also among them due to the devout compliance of my parents to the law. I thought to myself that nothing was impossible for God, and since he knew that I wanted and desired nothing but him, I knew that he could protect my virginity, if it pleased him. However, if not, I wanted his will to be done. After I had heard all the commandments in the temple, I returned home burning even more now than ever before with the love of God, being inflamed daily with new fires and desires of love. For this reason, I withdrew myself even more from everyone, and was alone day and night, fearing greatly, and most of all, that my mouth should say anything, or my ears hear anything against the will of my God, or that my eyes see anything alluring or harmful. I was also afraid in the silence, and very worried that I might be silent about things of which I should, instead, have spoken, while I was worried in my heart like this, alone by myself and placing all my hope in God, an inspiration about God's great power came over me, and I recalled how the angels and everything created serve him, and how his glory is indescribable and unlimited. While I was thus fascinated by this thought, I saw three wonderful things, I saw a star, but not the kind that shines in the sky, I saw a light, but not the kind that shines in this world. I smelled the fragrance, but not of herbs or anything else of this world. It was most delightful and truly indescribable, and it filled me up so completely that I jubilated with joy. After this, I immediately heard a voice, but not from a human mouth, and when I heard it, I shuddered with the great fear that it might be an illusion, or a mockery by an evil spirit. But shortly after this, an angel of God appeared before me, he was like the most handsome of men but not in the flesh as is the body of a created man, and he said to me, Hail, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. When I heard this, I wondered what he meant and why he had come to me with such a greeting, for I knew and believed that I was unworthy of any such thing, or any good thing. However, I also knew that nothing is impossible for God, if he desires it. Then the angel spoke again, The child to be born in you is holy and will be called the Son of God. May his will be done as it pleases him. But, not even then did I consider myself worthy, and I did not ask the angel why, or when, this would happen. Instead I asked him how it could be that I, an unworthy maiden, who did not know any man, should become the mother of God. The angel answered me, as I have just said, nothing is impossible for God, for whatever he wants to do will be done. When I had heard these words of the angel, I felt the most fervent desire to become the mother of God, and my soul spoke out of love and desire, saying, See, here I am, your will be done in me. With these words, my son was conceived in my womb to the indescribable joy of my soul and my every limb. While I had him in my womb, I bore him without any pain, without any heaviness or discomfort. 
I humbled myself in all things, knowing that he whom I bore was the Almighty. When I gave birth to him, it was also without any pain or sin, just as I had conceived him, but with such exaltation and joy of soul and body that my feet did not feel the ground where they had been standing because of this indescribable joy. Just as he had entered my limbs to the joy of all my soul, he left my body, leaving my virginity intact, and my soul and whole body in a state of indescribable joy and jubilation. When I gazed upon and contemplated his beauty, joy seeped through my soul like dewdrops and I knew myself to be unworthy of such a son. But when I considered the places where, as I had learned from the predictions of the prophets, nails would be pierced through his hands and feet at the crucifixion, my eyes filled with tears and my heart was almost torn apart by sorrow. When my son saw my weeping eyes, he became almost deathly saddened. However, when I considered his divine power, I was consoled again in knowing that this was what he wanted and that it should happen in this way, and I joined all my will to his. So my joy was always mixed with sorrow. When the time of my son's suffering arrived, his enemies seized him and struck him on the cheek and neck, spat at him and ridiculed him. Then he was led to the pillar of torture where he voluntarily removed his clothes and placed his hands around the pillar, and his enemies then mercilessly bound them. When he stood bound at the pillar, he had no covering at all, but stood naked as he had been born, suffering the shame of his nakedness. Then all my son's friends fled from him, and his enemies came together from all directions and stood there, skirting his body, which was pure from every stain and sin. I was standing nearby, and at the very first lashing, I fell down as if I were dead. When I regained consciousness, I saw his body whipped and scourged so badly that the ribs were visible. What was even more terrible, when the whip was pulled out, his flesh was furrowed and torn by it, just as the earth is by a plow. As my son was standing there, all bloody and wounded, so that no place could be found on him that was still intact and no sound spot could be scourged, then someone present there, aroused in spirit, asked, are you going to kill him before he is even judged? and he cut off his bonds immediately. Then my son put his clothes back on, and I saw that the place where he had been standing was filled with blood. By observing my son's footprints, I could see where he had walked because the ground was bloody there as well. They did not even wait for him to get dressed, but pushed and dragged him to make him hurry up. While my son was being led away like a robber, he wiped the blood from his eyes. When he had been sentenced to death, they placed the cross on him so that he could carry it to the place of suffering. When he had carried it for a while, a man came along and took the cross to carry it for him. As my son was going to the place of suffering, some people hit him on the neck, while others hit him in the face. He was so brutally and forcefully beaten that, although I did not see who hit him, I heard the sound of the blow clearly. When I reached the place of suffering with him, I saw all the instruments of his death lying there ready. When my son got there, he took off his clothes by himself. The executioners and the crucifiers said to each other, these are our clothes. He will not get them back because he is condemned to death. As my son was standing there, naked as he had been born, a man came running up and handed him a cloth with which he joyfully covered his private parts. Then the cruel executioners seized him and stretched him out on the cross. First, they fastened his right hand to the wooden beam, which was fashioned with holes for the nails, piercing the hand at the place where the bone was most solid and firm. Then they pulled out his other hand with a rope and fastened it, in a similar way, to the beam. Next they crucified the right foot, with the left foot on top of it, with two nails, so that all his sinews and veins were stretched so much that they burst. After they had done this, they put the crown of thorns one, on his head. It cut into my son's venerable head so deeply that his eyes were filled with blood as it flowed down, his ears were blocked by it, and his beard was totally soaked with it. As he stood there, so bloody and pierced, he felt sorry for me, for I was standing nearby and crying. Looking with his blood-filled eyes upon my nephew, John, he commended me to his care. At that moment I heard some people saying that my son was a robber. Others said that he was a liar and others that no one deserved to die more than did my son. My sorrow was renewed from hearing all this. And, as I said before, 
When the first nail was driven into him, I became overwhelmed by the sound of the first strike and fell down as if dead with darkened eyes, trembling hands, and faltering legs. In my bitter pain and great sorrow, I was not able to look up again until he had been completely nailed to the cross. But when I got up, I saw my son hanging pitifully, and I, his most sorrowful mother, was so grieved and heartbroken that I could barely stand up because of my great and bitter sorrow. When my son saw me and his friends in inconsolable tears, he called out with a loud and sorrowful voice to his father, saying, Father, why have you forsaken me? It was as if he wanted to say, There is no one who pities me but you, Father. By this time, his eyes seemed half dead. His cheeks were sunken, his face was sorrowful, his mouth open, and his tongue was bloody. His stomach was pressed in towards his back because of all the liquid that had been lost. It was as if he had no intestines. All of his body was pale and languid because of the loss of blood. His hands and feet were very rigidly outstretched, for they had been extended and made to conform to the shape of the cross. His beard and hair were completely soaked with blood. When my son stood there so bruised in pale blue, only his heart was still vigorous, for it was of the best and strongest nature. He had taken from my flesh the most pure and well-wrought body. His skin was so thin and tender that blood flowed out of it instantly if he was scourged even slightly. His blood was so fresh that it could be seen inside the pure skin. And because he had the very best constitution, life contended with death in his pierced body. Sometimes the pain from his pierced limbs and sinews rose up to his heart, which was still completely vigorous and unhurt and tormented it with the most unendurable pain and suffering. Sometimes the pain descended from his heart into his wounded limbs and, in so doing, prolonged his bitter death. Surrounded by these pains, my son beheld his weeping friends who, with his help, would rather have suffered his pain themselves or have burned in hell for all time than to see him tortured in this way. His sorrow over his friend's sorrow exceeded all the bitterness and grief which he had endured in body and heart, for he loved them so tenderly. Then, out of the exceedingly great suffering and anguish of his body, he cried out on account of his manhood to the Father, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. When I, his most sorrowful mother heard his voice, my whole body trembled in the bitter pain of my heart. As often as I later thought on this cry, it was as if still present and fresh in my ears, when his death drew near, his heart burst because of the violence of the pain. His whole body convulsed, and his head raised itself a little, and then dropped down again. His mouth was open and his tongue was completely bloody. His hands retracted a little from the place of the nail holes, and his feet were made to bear more of the weight of his body. His fingers and arms were stretched out somewhat, and his back was tightly pressed against the cross. Then some people said to me, Your son is dead, Mary. But others said, He is dead, but he will rise again. When everyone was going away, a man came and thrust his spear into his side so forcefully that it almost went out the other side. When the spear was pulled out, its point appeared to be red with blood. It seemed to me then, when I saw my beloved son's heart pierced, that my own heart had been pierced as well. Then he was taken down from the cross and I received his body onto my lap. He looked like a leper, and was completely covered with bruises and blood. His eyes were lifeless and filled with blood, his mouth as cold as ice, his beard like string, his face paralyzed, and his hands were so stiffened that they could not be bent over his chest, but only over his stomach, near the navel. I had him on my knee just as he had been on the cross, stiffened in all his limbs. After this, they laid him in a clean linen cloth and I dried his limbs with my own linen cloth and closed his eyes and mouth, which he had opened when he died. Then they laid him in the grave. I would willingly have been placed alive in the grave with my son if it had been his will. When these things were done, good John came and brought me home. Behold, my daughter, what my son has endured for you, and love him with all your heart.